and Nancy are a sensation. Together, they're a winning combination on the Speedway. He's a high-flying stock car jockey with a room full of trophies. I like to live dangerously. Honey, I'm going to leave the driving to you. Elvis has a one-track mind and a winning streak that couldn't be broken until he found a gorgeous, groovy government agent in his slipstream. Don't good night and goodbye me, Miss Internal Revenue Service. But your hands are... You gotta listen to me first. When they get together, something's gotta give. And give. You're argumentative, mulish. And give. You're wild, extravagant, and unreliable. Until... Just one kiss could tell us who we and Sinatra have the track to themselves in the racing, rocking, throbs and thrills of Speedway. Come on and sing, 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 sing. There ain't nothing like a song. Express Radio, and I have William Shallert with me. How are you doing, Mr. Shallert? I'm doing fine, Mr. Klein. How are you? Thank you. Uh, sir, can you first tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and uh, what your parents did for a living? Uh, well, yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born and raised here, and my father before me, which is not all that usual. I have a couple of granddaughters who, who, are, who live here in town who are fourth-generation Angelinos, which is really rare. But my... Uh, my father was the uh, drama editor of the Los Angeles Times for about 40 years, and my mother used to write for the uh, for various fan magazines, picture play, photo play, modern screen, things like that. Mm -hmm. She also was on the air uh, a couple of years in, in the 30s um, doing an, uh, an interview show, a short interview show, 15 minutes, but it was on, the, on NBC's Blue Network, which was sort of the... Uh, well, it was their unsponsored network, basically, but uh, once in a while somebody would get lucky. And she didn't, but but she, she was on for a couple of years, and she did some interesting interviews with... Uh, she basically had access to any of the major stars in Hollywood, and so she would review a picture and then talk to them about their lives. Something like what we're doing now, I guess, mm -hmm. except that these were, these were, you know, everybody who was anybody in Hollywood. And my father... Uh, you know, he was a newspaper man. He wrote uh, he wrote a daily column and, and a Sunday story and reviewed about about three movies or plays a, a week. And he was he was quite busy, and uh, so uh, that that was the background. The, uh, the, there was a lot of music in the family, and that's mm -hmm. what I was interested in to begin with. But I um, I, I I really couldn't. As I, I studied composing with Arnold Schoenberg, who taught at UCLA, but I, I figured out I could not do it fast enough to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I kind of stumbled into acting uh, while I was at UCLA. And uh, I started, uh, I joined, uh, after I got out of the Army, I joined a, a, a small group that was just starting then uh, at the, what was called the Circle Theater in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And it was kind of the fountainhead of the small theater movement in Los Angeles. It was the first of the of the serious small theaters in town. And uh, I mean, we had about 100, and we could see from 100 to 125 people, something like that. But it was theater in the round, which is what we've been doing when we were at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, after about 
four years working in the theater, I'd begun to start working in the business. And uh, then it was just a gradual, rather slow climb uh, upward. Uh, meanwhile, I got married. We began to have children, so I mm -hmm. had to work. I had to, yeah, have to I had feed to the kids. The family. I never did anything else. I tried a couple of other things, but they didn't work out at all. Mm -hmm. So this is the only thing that I was fit for, apparently. But, uh, well, I'm working I, at what you've done. You've done a lot. Yeah, I... I certainly have. I, vo, vo, it's always been a volume business for me. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I did, uh, I suppose most people would know, I was Patty Duke's father. Mm -hmm. I, I worked on the Dobie Gillis show as a teacher, uh, but I was under contract to the Patty Duke show as her father, and then the Nancy Drew mysteries, mm -hmm. and then uh, the new Gidget. And finally, uh, last series I did was called The Torkelsons. It was rather short-lived, but uh, mm -hmm. a nice show. I like like doing that. In the meanwhile, I worked in movies uh, over the years too. Uh, I was, uh, I'd say, my favorite picture was uh, "Lonely Are the Brave," which I did with Walter Matthau and Kirk Douglas uh, mm -hmm. back in the early '60s. And I was, I was in the, uh, the in the heat of the night and played the mayor in that. Uh, and uh, I, I worked for Don Siegel a couple of times. Uh, Charlie Varick, and uh, you've done a lot. For, <laughs> for Joe Dante, uh, I did uh, the Twilight Zone, the movie for him, and I, I did some other things, Interspace. And, uh, mm -hmm. cause I did a lot of science fiction films when I started. Which is something I like myself, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was really man from Planet X, which was a kind of a cheap knockoff of the uh, science fiction um uh, genre but uh mm -hmm. what's we a classic though just, just just before the thing which was really quality picture and so we got the benefit of their advertising and the picture did reasonably well uh -huh. i worked for the same guys a lot after that i was in the first picture that albert zucks ever did i worked for him over time mm -hmm. <coughs> so anyway uh i i continue to work on stage and i, I still i still uh I still am in a workshop uh, with Milton Katselis, who is a top-notch teacher and and uh, really one of the best people in the business, I think. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me just a second. Go. Okay. Go working ahead. With Kat, Go ahead. Working with Katselis has been good because it put me in touch with uh, with some with a lot of other actors in town, and for a while. Uh, my agency representation had kind of disappeared, but uh, I'm 85, and so you know you don't expect to be working a lot. But I've been with the same voiceover commercial agent now for 41 years. I think I'm the oldest person there, both in terms of my age and time. But uh, I started to work again. Uh, I've done about four or five shows this <laughs> past year. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Earl, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have a very good agent now, David Moss. So I, I feel like I'm back in the business in a way that I wasn't for a while. I mean, I never left it. I continue to work in voiceover work. And, uh, mm -hmm. I've done a variety of stuff over the years. So. Yeah, so you did uh, Disney stuff. Oh, yeah. I remember you. When I was a kid, I remember you some Disney stuff. So. <laughs> sure. Man from, I mean, uh, the strongest man in the world and the, and the, uh, the computer wore tennis shoes. So yeah, that's sure. right. Right. With uh, yeah. Kurt, Kurt Russell. Yeah, both with Kurt Russell. Yeah, nice, nice guy. Yeah. He's a good, a good young actor. He was uh, not a child at that point, but he was a, a teenage actor. And yeah, he was quite good, I thought. And he also his first film that he ever did was an Elvis film. It happened. Oh, really? at, it happened at the World's Fair. Yeah, he huh? got to kick Elvis in the shin twice. <laughs> <laughs> He probably would have enjoyed that. Yeah. So when well, did, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. When did you find out that you were going to do uh, an Elvis film? Um, well, I that was in 1968, 67, right after I'd finished doing the Patty Duke show. We'd been on the air for three years, and that was off. And I just started working in the voiceover commercial field, which is where I made most of my living for the next uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, even though I was still working in television and all that. So See, I'm not sure what voiceover is, sir, and I don't mean to. Oh, but. you know, that's uh, when, when you see a commercial, uh, you'll hear you'll hear somebody. Uh, like the narrator. Narrating uh, or or uh, telling you what the punchlines are. I used to be the, the voice of Milton the Toaster. I don't know if you 
remember it. <laughs> the toaster was the animated toaster who sold pop tarts. Okay. So I think I can't melt the toaster here. <laughs> Holy <laughs> goodness! <laughs> Eat your pop tarts. <laughs> what? Yeah, a, so, <laughs> did you do any other ones? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I did, I've done thousands of voiceover commercials over the years. Oh my goodness! I think that's just as interesting as Elvis stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it probably is. It certainly was uh, more interesting to me. I made a lot more money doing that than I did working with Elvis. So. Oh my goodness! But anyway, uh, so. I I uh, I got a call. Uh, they were interested in my playing this character, Abel Easterbeck, I think his name was. Right. Who was uh, I wouldn't know that except that last year I went down to uh, Memphis uh, yeah. at their invitation, and so I kind of uh, reconnected with the idea. But uh, I worked him. Yeah, I I worked on on uh, Speedway with him, and I had one quite interesting experience because uh, some of that was shot. Uh, on the speedway, theoretically, except they they use what they call pro process shot. <laughs> now, in a process shot, uh, they don't do that anymore. They use computer generated CGI. But in those days, they they used to uh, they would film uh, a racetrack uh, from a car as it was going around, and as cars were pass going past it, or or it was passing cars. They would have a, a record of that on film, which they could then project. They used to call it rear projection. There would be a screen, and they would set the camera up, and, and it would be a shot of, of the racetrack as seen from a racing car. When and but in order to coordinate that, uh, they had they had to have a mock-up car that was sitting in one place, and they would zero in on that with the camera they were actually going to shoot the film with <laughs> and then they would in the background on the screen you would see these cars racing by and it would look like the, the, this mock-up car was in the middle of the race so they could get a lot of close-up shots during the race it's what they used to do in films anytime you saw uh, a couple of actors in an automobile driving along a street that was probably a process shot mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you'd see Sometimes when you watch closely, you'd see the same car passing three times, that sort of thing. But uh, it took about two and a half hours or so to set that up. And meanwhile, Elvis and I were stuck in the car. Mm -hmm. So we kind of got to know each other. <laughs> uh, and it, I mean, he was, he was a really sweet guy, really nice guy, warm and very friendly. And uh, he was very deferential to me. I was older than he was. And he, used, he called me sir. <laughs> Mouth, so to speak. There you go. From, 
Elvis's mouth. And so, but the main thing was that personally, he was he was a very warm and ingratiating guy, very relaxed, no pressure or anything like that. And uh, it didn't seem like the kind of guy who would die young because he was very, yeah. uh, a very happy, relaxed guy. I thought. What a terrible shame. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, what a shock. And how was it working with Victoria and, uh, and the, the kids? It's got to be hard when you're working with kids. Well, <clears throat> I think that's one of the reasons they chose me. <laughs> I had worked with Patty Duke for three years, and she was youngish, and oh, there was also a young boy on the show. I was kind of a, uh, a nationwide father figure for a few years. Mm -hmm. And so I... Uh, and working with her was a, was a delight. She was a very talented girl, and I worked. I knew her mother. She was an actress. I, I Jean Jean Baird. Her last name. Yeah, Baird. Jean Baird, right? Yeah. yeah. And she and I had worked together, and so I knew her, uh, and I knew about the girl, but I had no idea how talented she was. She was terrific, and uh, she uh, she was uh, well, she was just a very talented child actress. And I guess she's gone on, and uh, she showed me a, a film that she'd made, she and her husband, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, she's now <laughs> she's now considerably older. Uh, if I'm 85, she must be. Anyway, she's not a child anymore. Very talented young lady. Mm -hmm. uh, and Elvis and she got along fine. Yeah, because she, she was eight years old, wasn't she? About eight years old when she did that. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I got a granddaughter here who's nine, and uh, so I, I know, you know, we raised four boys, but we also have had seven grandkids, five of them were girls, so I've seen those grow over the years. Mm -hmm. it, Jeannie was, uh, <coughs> Jeannie was a really talented kid. It's not, it's not easy to do that kind of work. Uh, it helped that her mother was an actress, but I mean, either you've got a knack for it or you don't, and mm -hmm. she had a knack. So uh, I guess that's why she's still involved. She's she was very sweet, and uh, all the the director of the film, Norman Torog, was supposed to be a great child director. That was his reputation. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like to <coughs> speak ill of the dead, but I, I didn't think he handled the kids very well at all. He was he was very harsh with them. Really, and kind of a kind of like a child wrangler, you know, mm -hmm. more, more like that. And in fact, he kind of deferred to me. He said, "Well, you know, you get it, you get get them ready, will you? Make sure that they're all set." So, <laughs> sure, I, sir. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't have any problem with that because we had kids, and I was used to dealing with with young young boys, but mm -hmm. young girls are not that different, actually. Up to a certain age, they're all pretty much the same. So I had a, I had a, I had a lot of, a lot of stuff to do on the show besides just act, and it was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I, I got to know them, and I liked them. They were. They were sweet, sweet kids, and uh, they, they weren't they weren't bratty or, or kind of out of control. Mm -hmm. But but uh, you know the way some some kids who work in the business get get very full of themselves. Mm -hmm. so these these were all nice. Guys. How was uh, how was Elvis? Do you think as an actor? Um, he was a very natural actor. I don't I don't think he he had to work at it much. You know he. he uh, he had a. Uh, he seemed to have access to his emotions, which is a key thing for an actor. If he was supposed to be upset or angry or anything like that, uh -huh. that was easy for him. And uh, I, I don't know that he was ever called upon to cry or, or be that broken up about something. But but if he was, whatever he did was very real. The, the main thing I think about him was that. He, he he was as natural in his acting as, as he was in his singing. The singing just seemed to come out of him without any effort at all. Yeah, yeah. Even though it was remarkable. I mean, he was an icon of the time, and, mm -hmm. and still today for people. And he had a he had among other things a terrific voice. He's a beautiful voice. He's got that. Uh, There's no tomorrow, which is so solo mio. Mm -hmm. And I used to hear that in a in a play I was doing, and it was they were playing it every night, and I, I got to. He produced his voice uh, really well. I don't know that he ever had any formal training, but he just had a natural. No, he didn't. Yeah, he well, never had any formal training. No. Everything he did naturally was was really top notch. It was the yeah. top edge of the professional. Now, Bill Bixby was on that film too. Yeah, 
and Nancy, Nancy Sinatra. Yeah, Nancy Sinatra, beautiful woman. And uh, uh, Bill Bixby, he kind of played the uh, the one that got Elvis in trouble a lot. Uh, how was how was everybody on the set? I mean, was there fooling around in that on the set? I, I, I guess um, you'd have I to didn't, get... I, I didn't work with... Uh, with uh, well, I, we had one, one of those crowd scenes where I was with Nancy and, uh, and, and Bill Bixby. <laughs> but we didn't work together very much. Mm-hmm. Um, as I say, I, I worked almost entirely with Elvis, and I spent the most time on the show practically with Elvis when mm-hmm. we were in that mock-up car during the uh, during the race. He was um, a big speed. Was you know really really a nice guy, uh, and uh, he was a capable actor. Uh, and Nancy Sinatra, uh, you know, I wish I had. Uh, paid a little more attention to her because I think she's a very interesting person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, w- we were in separate worlds. Uh, the stars in pictures don't have that much to do with the, with the people who are farther down the the track. I think one exception to that was when I worked with Walter Matthau and Kirk Douglas because Matthau and I did all our work together, so mm-hmm. we got to know each other real well, and we were best friends for. Up until the day he died, in fact, he lived right around the corner from me, and uh, I convinced him this was a better place to live than Beverly Hills, and he, he agreed, so he stayed here. <laughs> but uh, he and I were in Pacific Palisades, is where I live. It's right next between Santa Monica and Malibu, and it, it overlooks the Pacific Ocean. But but we're we're back a little from the edge, mm-hmm. about 75 years of the present rate of crumble, I'd say. And you get that much closer, huh? <laughs> yeah, a little closer than you'd like, but it's fine where we are. <coughs> but um, so Walter and I were really good friends, uh, and I don't know. I guess if I <coughs> heard me, I okay. shouldn't have said yes when when you said let's start. <laughs> I've just I've just woke up. I was watching The Godfather last night, and it was fascinating to see. So I was up later than I should have been. Great film. Elvis and his group, the, the Mafia, the Memphis Mafia, would hang around on the set, 
and they they kid around, but my, you know it wasn't. They weren't they weren't doing anything very disruptive or outrageous. They, it's just that they all knew each other, and he felt very comfortable with them. So uh, it was a that was a very supportive atmosphere for him, and he I think it was good for him to have friends around who mm-hmm. kept him tied to his roots, uh, and so. Uh, because you know Hollywood is a very deceptive place for people if they get to be really big mm-hmm. it's easy to lose your bearings and wander off mm-hmm. and Elvis that doesn't really happen to Elvis in Hollywood I don't know what happened in Las Vegas but nothing not here and those guys were with him uh, on the set he, he made sure that they they've always had something to do in the pictures I imagine yep he did he and Ed or Ed or Colonel Parker would make sure that he was surrounded by people that he felt comfortable with because I imagine that's one of the reasons he was such a natural actor and, that, and these guys were also good musicians so mm-hmm. it, it all tied together did you um, run into uh, Colonel Parker at all do you remember him on the set uh, at all I, you know don't if remember. I met him he didn't make a, a, a vivid impression on me I don't think I did he might have been around uh, on the set most likely was but it might have been a day when I wasn't working or I might not have been on that part of the set. Mm-hmm. That there was a, we, were, we had one set that was kind of like a nightclub, I guess. It was a right. large, big set. And so if, if somebody was visiting and was there, uh, mm-hmm. I imagine Parker would have stayed off the, off the scene anyway and been in Elvis's dressing room and talked to him there if he had anything to say. So when the film was all done, uh, did you get to say goodbye to Elvis and uh, everybody? or? Uh, well... It doesn't usually happen like that. No, see, I know, uh, and I don't mean to. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I don't remember. I may have. Uh, I probably did, but I, I don't have any special recollection of it. It's it, it's quite possible that that, uh, that he was already finished and I was still working or that, that I was going to still, or that I was finished and he was still working. Mm. And so I, I might have said goodbye to one of those circumstances. But otherwise, I, I doubt that we would have. It would have been, you know, uh, at the end of the day or mm-hmm. something like that. Because the film doesn't happen the way you see it. <laughs> and no. I think that's what confuses me, because I, I'm not an actor. And the film does not happen the way that you see it. And sometimes the ending might be done first. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's, uh, the key point about it is that it's possible in a film to juggle time. You can do whatever you want in whatever order you want and then put it all together. And however you structure it when you put it together is what seems to be the real time. But it's quite right that uh, things that appear in the beginning of a picture might well have been shot on the last day. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, the, the two things are entirely separate. That's why film is such, <coughs> pardon me, such a, an interesting medium. One of the early Russian directors, uh, did a famous thing with them. He shot uh, an old peasant man, and he, he shot his face for about, uh, maybe about five minutes of film on it. And then he intercut it with a series of different things, like a tra- train wreck, uh, a baby crying, uh, a mother holding her child, uh, a dog, a cute dog. And it all, they shot just this peasant's face as he looked at, as he was looking at the camera, and he didn't know what he was looking at, uh, what he appeared to be looking at. They put that in later, but it was possible for that same shot of the face to react to all of those things and be believable. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it looked like he was watching the train wreck. In fact, he wasn't. None of those things were, were actually happening that way. But because of the editing process, you could you could edit things together. I think people probably are much more aware of that now that because it's possible to make home movies with video cameras and things like that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the things are are seen at the same time on the screen or, or appear to be at the same time on the screen is, is very deceptive because that's not how it happens. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get to um, talk or uh, meet or did you ever see Elvis in uh, concert after uh, the no. film? Never no, did. I did. Hey, Elvis was... Uh, came along after I'd sort of grown up with my own ideas about music. I, I was a big big band uh, follower of uh, Benny Goodman and the mm-hmm. Party Shaw and Glenn Miller. Which I enjoy listening to myself. 
especially I like, and I also like the uh, the smaller jazz trios, Artie Shaw and Benny Goodman, both had mm-hmm. good groups. I I saw some memorable concerts at the Hollywood uh, Hollywood Bowl, of all places. I saw Benny Goodman when he in 1939. They, that was when when they were doing Sing Sing Sing, which is one of the great jazz mm-hmm. songs of all time. And uh, that was that was my idea of great stuff. And, uh, he had some terrific people playing with him. Uh, then uh, and uh, same thing applied to Artie Shaw. And good singers too. So, so can you remember? Um, can you remember when you heard that Elvis had passed away? Uh, and what did you feel? Or no, I I didn't. I just thought. I guess I'd seen that he'd gained some weight, but but I really didn't. I was it was a shock. I, I know it was kind of a shock heard around the world uh, because Elvis had millions and millions of fans. Uh, I but I was not really an Elvis an Elvis uh, mm-hmm. fan or an Elvis junkie. Uh, mainly because I by then I'd kind of graduated. I didn't hear. I didn't listen to music a lot. Uh, I was busy trying to earn my living as an actor and we were uh, raising the kids and it wasn't our kind of music right that, that was kind of the beginning of rock and roll was uh, or rhythm and blues that didn't particularly appeal to me that was not my kind of music mm-hmm. afterwards I listened to Elvis and I realized what a remarkable musician yeah. and performer he was but that that came later on yeah. and probably after he died because I didn't pay much attention to his his, well, his career as a singer I hope I'm not breaking too many people's hearts. No, no. <laughs> so after you Speedway, know, it's you did. It's after, a generational thing. You, yeah. you listen to the music you can grow up with, and then you go through a period where you don't listen much. I, that was my case anyway. Yeah. So after Speedway, you you did an awful lot. Um, did did you? You said you just got back into acting. So did you kind of retire at a certain age? And no, I didn't retire exactly. But I I had an agent who really wasn't able to work for me. They got bought out by a bigger agent, and then there was a period I went through where uh, where there was nothing much happening. They weren't sending me out of anything. So mm-hmm. um, I but I never. Re- I mean. Acting is the only thing I know how to do, and I love to. I love to act. I still get great pleasure out of working in a workshop where I, where there's no pay or anything like that. But, but I'm, I'm working in front of a very perceptive director and teacher, Milton Katsalas, and he's got a very a good group of people there. There's about a hundred people in the class all together. Doris Roberts is one of them, you know, from Raymond, mm-hmm. and uh, they're. There's a lot of good, a lot of good people there, and so I enjoy acting. And uh, uh, also, when I, when I uh, it was my theatrical agent, that kind of disappeared, and for about three years, I didn't really have representation. But I was still active in the voiceover commercial field. Uh, I, I wasn't working as much, but you know, once you reach the age of eighty, you don't expect to work a lot. I mean, I, I, I figure I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> let alone working but uh, and, and I have my share of ailments and illnesses and things like that but uh, but I'm I'm in reasonably good shape I still look roughly the same as I did except my hair is white now yeah. finally for a long time I used to dye it you know everybody does that but I got tired of the process yeah. <laughs> so the last two three years I've had my hair natural which it happens to be a pretty good kind of silvery white and uh so I've uh, and I've I've worked, uh, you know. In the last year, I've been out for on eight interviews, and I got four of them. So that's not a bad average. Yeah. Now, out of everything that you've done, is there one that sticks in your mind that you think that I really was hot on that? And that's one of my good ones. Yeah, I would say that I would say that Lonely or the Brave was one of the best pictures I did. Yeah. I, I was I thought it was I thought it was good. I, I've I've been good in a lot of things I've done. Some of them were smaller parts, but I mean, uh, but in in pictures where I made a contribution, I'd say Lonely Are the Brave or Charlie Varick or uh, or maybe even uh, In the Heat of the Night because that part was mm-hmm. crucial. He was a small town mayor, yeah, and apparently a very up to date, but he turned out to be a dangerous racist when he got when he was pushed to it, and that was unusual for me to get to play something like that. Those were things I loved. The, the best work I've done, the work where I've had the most satisfaction, was on the stage, 
rather than uh, rather than in uh, movies. I, I guess I've done my share of television work that was pretty good. I, I've done series. Yeah, yeah a lot. series. I used to play an old admiral on Get Smart. I used to like that a lot. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched Get Smart, but yeah, no, I remember Get it, Smart. Well, yeah. I played. Admiral I see. Here Mark come Ray. the brides. Ninety-seven. He used to fall down all the time. Yeah. He, he was. Uh, I. I I did I did a lot of good comedy stuff over, over the years. I worked with Red Skelton and I worked with uh, Carol Barnett, and people like that. Mm-hmm. You but never played a lot of villains, did you? Except the one that you just mentioned. I mean, because no, I... uh, in the in the back in the fifties and the early sixties, I played my share of villains on did shows you? like Gunsmoke. Uh, uh, I can remember playing a psychotic head of a gang on Gunsmoke. I yeah, I got to play things, but my basic personality is pleasant right and and I don't look very threatening so I mean I'm tall and, and slim if I'm going to be polite about it or thin right. if I'm not and so I the only, the only thing is that I'm able to um, I have a wide range as an actor I'm a, a real character actor I can play I'm very good at accents and dialects and things like that and yeah so I can and I can change my voice quite a bit so when I play the old admiral and get smart, except it sounded older than I do today. <laughs> he was 97. <laughs> well, <laughs> I always figured that's what would happen to your voice, but my voice would be having to change. I was going to say, I mean, uh, it would be like Christopher Walken playing Santa. Christopher yeah. Walken replays a lot of villains because you just look at him and he just goes, God, he's just mean. And, <laughs> and he's not. He's actually, he's not. He's, he's very no, pleasant. I admire his work. He's terrific. He's also a very good dancer. Is he? Terrific, da- terrific dancer. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he's, he does great tap and things like that. Yeah. And once while he gets to do that. Yeah, no, I, I like him a lot. Matthau was a guy that I really admired a lot. He and I Walter Matthau? Yeah. Yeah. He and I worked together on that picture. And then after that, we worked together several times because he would request me. And uh, so things like that. And I, I love playing the old Admiral on Get Smart. I would yeah. say that was one of my favorite roles. And on stage, I, uh, I I was in a play called The Trial of the Catonsville Nine, and that moved to New York from Los Angeles. And while I was back there, I, I got an Obie Award, Off Broadway Award. We uh-huh. And uh, so I was I was good in that, and I've, I've been good in a number of other things on stage, particularly uh, uh, the male animal. I played the part. Uh, if, you, if you know it, you, you know the guy, the, the professor. I, I'm I'm pretty good type. To play professors and teachers, I think. Mm-hmm. Do you ever anyway, do cartoons? So, do you ever do cartoons? Uh, no, my voice doesn't blend itself to that much, even though I did, yeah, I can't melt the toaster here. Yeah. Even though I did that for about 10 years, in general, my voice is, is so identifiable that I, I, I have a distinctive timbre, which is why I did a lot of voiceover work. Uh, right. But, but, um, a lot of uh, commercial work, but but then uh, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't able to do the kinds of wild things that people do today when they do cartoon work. It would yeah. destroy my voice. Yeah. And, uh, some of them have a hard time surviving it too. But you have to be able to uh, really distort your voice, and that's not my specialty. Yeah. My specialty is being real as myself. Well, I thank you very much, sir, for uh, doing this for Elvis Express Radio. Sure. It's nice working with him and being reminded of it, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Take a tongue, hold some steel, a whole lot of sweat, set of wheels on the speedway. Flag is down, pistons pound, plenty of engines ripping the ground. On the speedway, hold for the money and lead the pack. Push the throttle and burn the track. Curl them swerve like you're doing the dance. Straight away it's coming and now you're doing the dance. On the speedway, on the speedway, on the speedway. Stomp that pedal down the floor as much as you can.
make a spin if it breaks. And your little girl shivers and shakes on the speedway. There's a way coming through. A kiss from your baby is pushing you on the speedway. Go for the money and lead the pack. Push the throttle and 